about scattering amplitude in two-star search theory. Please take it over. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me opportunity to speak about this uh, topic, uh, which actually does not really directly fit with the title of the conference, which is about string theory, gravity, and cosmology. And I seem to be talking about something which doesn't directly fit with any of these. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I would, uh, I think this would be useful, particularly when one applies these kind of techniques to uh, double field theory formalism, in which one could try to uh, utilize this information to uh, compute gravity amplitudes. Uh, this may be one of the kind of remote motivation of what I am doing right now. Uh, so, uh, so let me start uh, by just presenting the plan of the talk. I will give an introduction and also talk about uh, spinor helicity formalism in general for massless theories. That's where the formalism originated first. Uh, then uh, kind of briefly talk about how it is used uh, in N equals 4 super young mills theory. Uh, and uh, then talk about uh, extension of that to massive theories. Uh, and uh, after talking about extension, I will kind of apply it to an equals two star super Hamilton's theory uh, in which we studied uh, scattering amplitudes uh, and also kind of derived BCF BCFW relation, uh, recursion relation. And then I'll kind of uh, summarize it. Okay, so uh, the introduction is a little longish one, but nevertheless, uh, so computation of scattering amplitudes is one of the basic requirements in high energy physics, uh, where you want to compare theoretical computations, theoretical results with the experimental observation, observations. And uh, so of course the physical, uh, physically observable quantity is not the scattering amplitude itself, but uh, the scattering cross section. But all the crux of the scattering cross section, the physics of it is sitting inside the uh, scattering amplitude. So uh, for every, uh, physical observable that we want to take to an experimentalist, we need to compute a, uh, appropriate scattering amplitude. And we would really need to have an efficient technique for uh, doing this computation uh, such that one could kind of evaluate physically relevant quantities. Uh, one of the techniques that we use, uh, we have been using and still continue to use is the quantum field theory technique in which we use perturbative methods uh, write down Feynman rules, draw Feynman diagrams, compute those Feynman diagrams, and then of course utilize those results to compute uh, the physically relevant quantities. Okay, now of course, you know, computing Feynman diagrams is something which has become kind of part of our profession. Everybody knows uh, how to do this uh, particular computation. But typically, if you think of say quantum field theory course, uh, we rarely ask or rarely even try to compute in the class uh, say eight point function, uh, even in scalar field theory or, or in gauge theory. And the reason is simple because the number of Feynman diagrams, even at a fixed loop level or even at, at times at tree level, is just too large. Uh, just to get an idea of what it is, if you consider QCD at tree level, you know, and if you consider, say, a five point function, the number of graphs that you have to compute is about 25. If you compute six point function, this is just only gluon computation, not even taking quarks into account and generations or different flavors of quarks, nothing. You know, uh, if you take six point, you get you have to compute 220 graphs and seven point like more than 2,500, almost 2,500 graphs. Now, uh, of course, one can develop computer uh, programs to do these kind of computations very fast. But the point is that at the end of the computation, you get an expression which is extremely simple. Okay, and it doesn't look like why one needs to go through so many uh, graphs to arrive at a computation which is as simple as this. So one believes that there may be a better way of doing these computations and scattering amplitude techniques is one of the tech methods that one has used to arrive at these results in a more efficient way. Okay. So, uh, no, Spinor helicity formalism is one of the methods which has been used in computational scattering amplitudes. Uh, it dates back um, uh, almost 40 years. Uh, uh, and one of the early results were by Park and Taylor and then Berings and Jay and various other people who have contributed to this field. Uh, and 
Park and Taylor actually showed that if you want to compute uh, tree level amplitude in gauge theory, uh, which is with arbitrary point, endpoint amplitude, it can be written in the one which I have written down here uh, in terms of this AN. And it is, uh, it looks very simple. Okay, of course, I need to explain this angle bracket uh, notation, which I'll come to in a moment. Uh, but this computation for arbitrary n would have required computing large number of Feynman diagrams, but um, spin or helicity formalism seems to do it much faster. Okay, MHV is the short form for maximum helicity violating amplitude. That would mean that if you consider all ingoing particles, all ingoing, say, gauge fields, then most of them carry positive helicity except two, which I mentioned it here explicitly, I and J, which have negative helicity. Okay. Uh, you could consider all positive helicity, like from one to N, that amplitude vanishes. One negative helicity also vanishes. So non-vanishing maximum helicity amplitude requires minimally two, um, uh, two uh, gauge fields with opposite helicity. And that is the one which has this amplitude expression written up here. Okay, we will come to the form of this expression uh, soon, although I will not be writing for arbitrary n, uh, except here. So the formulation of this uh, spinor helicity formalism in terms of twisters was given by Witten in 2003, and soon after that, uh, Bitto, Pechazo, Feng, and Witten uh, uh, gave a formulation of computation of amplitudes in terms of re using recursion relation by starting with lower point amplitudes computing higher point. Point amplitudes uh, was kind of provided by the so-called BCFW recursion relations. Okay, uh, it turns out that it was of course clear in Witten's paper also that this formalism is very well suited for computing amplitudes in maximally supersymmetric animals theory, namely any possible super animals theory. And uh, of course, this theory is highly constrained, and you know it has kind of various. Uh, advantages due to large amount of supersymmetry, but nevertheless, this technique shows its power even in the, those computations. Detailed accounts of these kind of uh, formalism, there are already a few books, uh, uh, there's one by Ilvan Huang, there's one by Arkan Yamid and collaborators, there's one by Hen and Plefka, uh, where one can get more details about this formalism. Okay. okay, what we will do here today is to explore uh, generalization of this formalism to n equals two star theory. Uh, I'm sorry, now, can I can I can I ask one thing? Sure. Yeah. So is, is that that's the same method with the Swinger Dyson uh, equations or uh, are, are completely others, completely different? Uh, no, no, no. It's not like Swinger Dyson equation. It tells it gives you a mechanism of kind of right. Uh, you mean BCFW recursion relation, right? So, so in the usual field theory, if you know the endpoint function, then from that you can some derive the n plus one point function like the Schwinger Dyson process. This is that. That is right. Uh, here, what one is uh, doing is uh, computing on shell amplitudes where you have an internal propagator going on shell and you do a contour integral to pick up the uh, amplitude. Okay, that is the technique. Not exactly the Schwinger Dyson type. Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Fine, so what we want to do is to study n equals two star theory and uh, to just uh, give a little explanation as to why n equals two star. Uh, one of the thing is, one of the ways one could talk about n equals two star theory is to start with n equals four super angles theory and write that in terms of n equals two representation. So, n equals four super angles theory can be you know, super angles multiplet can be written in terms of n equals two vector multiplet plus a massless adjoint hypermultiplet of n equals two theory. Okay, so uh, so one could just study n equals two uh, super angles theory and couple to massless adjoint hypermultiplet. That is equivalent to studying n equals four angles. Okay, but what you can do is that if you write it in terms of n equals two theory, then there is no reason why your adjoint hypermultiplet should be massless. You couldn't give it a mass. If you do that, then it explicitly breaks n equals four supersymmetry and the theory only has n equals two uh, supersymmetry. This theory is referred to as n equals two star. Okay, so it essentially has the same uh, field content as n equals uh, four theory, except that the adjoint hypermultiplet is massive. 
Okay, and the reason for, uh, for doing this is that if one wants to generalize the spinor helicity formalism to lower supersymmetric theories, then one place where, uh, for example, to any plus two theories in general, the place where you could you would, may want to test your uh, weapons whether they work, where your instruments, your formalism works well. Any plus two star is a good place because you have massless gauge field. Uh, you could also make that gauge field massive if you wish, but you have massless vector multiplet and a massive hyper multiplet, and you have a, a massive field in your theory, and you want to check whether your formalism works there. If it works there, then you could kind of go ahead and try to apply it to theories where multiple fields are massive. For example, general n equals two theories. Okay, so in that sense, n equals two star is a natural transition point um, to explore theories with low supersymmetries. Okay, so here we go. Uh, we'll start with uh, spinor helicity formalism for massless theories to start with. Okay, in the massless theory, we basically have p squared equals zero for every particle. Okay, now all particles are massless. Okay, and pi minus pj whole squared is written just as minus two times pi dot pj because pi squared is zero, pj squared is also zero. Okay, so uh, if you have pi squared is equal to zero, then it is equivalent to saying that you can write down P in terms of a matrix, a two by two matrix, which is like PI mu, sigma mu, alpha, alpha dot. And then this matrix has vanishing determinant. If that is the case, then you can write down PI in terms of uh, by spinors, lambda and lambda tilde. Okay. Uh, and uh, if you do that, then you could uh, kind of express uh, the vectors uh, in the theory, uh, particularly Null vectors in the theory in terms of by spinors. Okay, and what we are going to do is to use these spinors for computation of the amplitudes. Okay, so we are of course not going to keep writing lambda i alpha and lambda tilde i alpha dot uh, kind of stuff. We are going to use a little more efficient notation. Uh, the index i basically is an index of a particle. Uh, we don't have to worry about lambda because if lambda, if you have lambda, then it always carries undotted index. If you have lambda tilde, it always carries dotted index. So we want to use the angle bracket and square bracket notation for noting, writing down lambda as a square bracket, lambda tilde as angle bracket, and uh, they can be written in a and kit form uh, as per the location of the alpha index. Okay. Now, on the top, we have written down the momentum in terms of lambda and lambda tilde, and you can easily see that there is a scaling property that uh, of the lambda and lambda tilde, which leaves the momentum invariant. Okay, this scaling property is essentially the little group uh, invariance of the massless theory. <clears throat> okay, so here's the explicit form of the momentum p alpha dot alpha written in this uh, matrix form, and you can write that in terms of lambda tilde and lambda. And using our notation, it can be written as angle bracket P with um, uh, times the square bracket P. Okay. Now, once you use that formalism, then you can ask how the Mandelstam variables can be written down because most of the amplitudes should be written in terms of Mandelstam variables. And Mandelstam variables for, uh, say, particle with I, particle with uh, I particle and J particle momenta would be written as SIJ, which is PI plus PJ squared and which is 2 pi dot pj, and that using this form of p uh, can be written down as angle bracket ij times square bracket ij. The angle bracket ij, if you want to write down explicitly in terms of lambda spinors, is written as epsilon alpha beta lambda alpha lambda beta. Okay, so I forgot to write down lambda i alpha times lambda j beta. Actually, that's what I should have really written down. Uh, that, that's a typo out there. Uh, similarly, ang square bracket, uh, sorry, angle bracket ij would be dotted with dotted indices and lambda tilde, square bracket ij will be with undotted indices with lambdas. But you notice one thing that epsilon alpha beta ensures that these both angle and square bracket are anti-symmetric uh, with respect to index i and j. Okay, so here's, I'm repeating the same stuff again. So uh, the statement that I just made that the angle bracket and square bracket are anti-symmetric by virtue of having the epsilon alpha beta sitting around there. Okay. Now, if you want to compute gauge field amplitudes in uh, say a pure gauge theory, uh, they can be decomposed according to their uh, 
helicities. Okay, so you can write down gauge field in terms of its helicity, positive helicity, negative helicity, and then you can compute amplitudes by choosing the uh, particles with specific helicities and compute those amplitudes. Okay, so for example, the one which I mentioned as maximum helicity violating amplitude, the first non vanishing maximum helicity violating amplitude must necessarily contain at least two particles with opposite helicity. Okay, otherwise the amplitude would vanish. Now, uh, so one nice place where one can see a simple amp MHV amplitude is a four point uh, amplitude of gluons, four gluon amplitude with two positive helicity gluons with two negative helicity gluons. Now you may think that like if that is the case, then you there is no chance of having the three point amplitude. But that is not the case. The three point amplitude has a special kinematic uh, uh, kinematics in which case you could you can show that uh, you basically allow the momenta to become complex and you can show that uh, you can either keep the angle bracket non-vanishing and square bracket vanishing or, or vice versa and write down three point amplitude in terms of only one kind of brackets. Okay, and you can use those lower point amp three point amplitude to construct four, five, and higher point amplitudes using the BCFW relation. Okay, so I repeat the sentence that the non-vanishing MHV amplitude must contain at least two particles of opposite helicity. So here's a one example. If you consider two uh, positive helicity and two negative helicity gluons, then its amplitude is written entirely in terms of angle bracket. So you don't even need to know what is the expression for the square bracket. If that square bracket expression could even be zero, uh, angle bracket expression is written in this uh, particular form. This is just a reduction of the Park Taylor formula that I had written down for four particles. Okay, uh, as I mentioned, that the spatial kinematics ensure that the three point amplitude is non trivial from which the, all these four point amplitudes can be constructed. Now, BCFW recursion relation is obtained by doing uh, interesting uh, change in the momenta. So what you do is that you pick two uh, momenta out of the set of n momenta, if I suppose you're considering n point amplitude, then pick any two and uh, say suppose uh, i-th particle and j-th particle, then you shift their momenta to p hat i, which is pi plus z times r, where r is some null momentum, and pj hat is equal to pj minus z times r. Okay. And you choose R in such a way that PI dot R, PJ dot R, and R dot R are zero. Okay, so you, with that, you can kind of uh, figure out as to how you have shifted these momenta. Z is an arbitrary complex number. Okay, now what you do is you divide the set of part particles into two sets. Okay, and in such a way that every set contains one exactly one particle with which has uh, shifted momentum. So you have two sets of uh, particles. One set contains PI, the other set contains uh, PJ. Okay. And one is looking at a diagram where the amplitude coming from first set goes through a propagator into the second set. Okay. The, currently, the amplitudes that we are looking at are really three levels. So one is not even worried about one PI kind of uh, condition. But if you are considering a propagator which is going from one set to another set, they, that propagator necessarily contains uh, information about Z because one of the momentum on, in the set is shifted. Okay, so therefore the propagator connecting those two sets, so suppose they say set capital I and a set capital J, the propagator will be P hat square and that P hat square can be written in terms of P i square times two times Z times R dot P i. Okay. Uh, now notice that this pi is a sum of all momenta. R dot p small i and r dot p small j is zero, but r dot p capital I may not be zero because it contains many other momenta which are not shifted. You can write that expression in terms of pi squared upon z i, where z i is the expression which you can derive from this expression. Okay. So notice now one thing that as that whenever z is equal to z i, your pi hat uh, goes on shell. It is again massless. Okay, so what we find so this is the expression written again. So when z is equal to z, I uh, p i hat square is on shell. So what you can do is, if you want to compute endpoint amplitudes, you can club that into two smaller sets, which you call an amplitude A L, which is sitting on the left of uh, side of the propagator, uh, amplitude which is A R, which is sitting on the right side of the propagator, and then there is a p i hat propagator, 
connecting these two amplitudes. All these lower point amplitudes can be computed starting from three point amplitude using the same technique that uh, for which this expression is written. Okay, and you can construct the higher point amplitude by just summing over all possible uh, diagrams involving the set I. Okay, now whenever pi hat square goes on shell, there is a pole because z is going to z i, and what you can do is to collect the residue at that pole, and that will give you the amplitude uh, endpoint amplitude of the uh, in the theory. Okay, that is the basic idea of the BCFW uh, formalism. Uh, it, I should warn at uh, this point that like it's not like it works for all possible choices of uh, helicities. It does work for many uh, helicity choices, not necessarily maximum helicity violating, but next to maximum, next to next to maximum helicity violating, and so on. But there exists certain configuration in which this particular setup has a pole at infinity, and you need to take care of that particular situation. Okay, and it is. It's not that it is impossible to handle that, but uh, one needs to be careful. One needs to ensure that there is no pole at infinity, so that when you co collect the residue at, at z is equal to z i, it actually gives a correct amplitude. Otherwise, you need to take the additional contribution uh, from infinity uh, to get your amplitude right. Okay. Now, this is a small caveat which happens to be true for much smaller set of possible amplitudes. Uh, than uh, the amplitudes in which the BCFW actually happens to work. Okay. Now, I should also mention that all the amplitudes that I'm writing down here are so-called color color ordered amplitude. That means if we are if I'm writing the amplitude for objects which carry uh, gauge indices, then those gauge indices are actually stripped uh, out, and one has ordered those those uh, color indices in a particular fashion. And only for that particular color ordering, a uh, computation of this type has been uh, carried out. Of course, if you can, if you you can always change the color ordering. The amplitude computation look could looks very similar. It's just that the color ordering is different for that. Okay, and uh, what one finds in these computations that there exists a, a symmetry between the color ordering and the kinematic ordering, and which is referred often referred to as color kinematic duality which is a source of some interesting results in what's called a double copy formalism in this uh, theory, uh, uh, where what one does is that one replaces, one removes the color component of the amplitude and just doubles the kinematic component of the amplitude to make a double copy of the kinematic uh, part of the uh, amplitude. And you, it has been shown uh, particularly in uh, in the large supersymmetry uh, supergravity computations, that this double copy uh, computation uh, correctly reproduces the supergravity amplitude. In that sense, the uh, double copy formalism is one efficient way of computing amplitudes in supergravity theories. Okay, so of course I am not going to do double copy right now. I am going to do only color order color order amplitudes in Young Mills theory. Okay. Sorry, so, sorry, sorry. Can, can I? Uh, um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I lose some. Yeah, I lose something. Uh, so, so what was the notion of the momentum pi hat uh, goes on shell? Uh, I, I. Okay. So, so what I'm saying is that, like, remember, we have done this modification of pi going to pi plus z uh, times r. R is a null uh, momentum, and z is an arbitrary complex parameter. Okay. So when you find a pole at z is equal to z i. That's where pi hat goes on shell because when z goes to z i, pi hat squared goes to zero. Okay. okay. So, so picking a contribution at z is equal to z i would tell you that your amplitude has actually gone on shell. You know, if you look at this uh, expression at the bottom, a n pi hat square going to zero is basically that propagatory is on shell. Okay. Okay. You can compute the contribution by computing the residue at uh, z is equal to z i. Okay. Now, the total amplitude is not just one such term. Okay. You can have various uh, configurations where, uh, you know, L, the set L may have like five particles, R may have three, L may have four particles, R may have four, and so on. And all of them put together is an eight point amplitude, for example. Okay. All possibility. You have to sum over all such diagrams. Okay. But each one of those diagrams are. 
relative pretty easy to compute compared to actually computing uh, Feynman diagram for eight point amplitude. Okay, which would contain with the order of you know, ten thousand diagrams. Okay, is this a almost a I think that the similar thing that we only compute some uh, scatter and cross section by using optical theorem. Then uh, the line becomes only shared by inserting delta function of momentum. That not that really because like not really because optical theorem still uses computation of the amplitude in a very conventional way. So the amplitude computation is still pretty messy. Okay. Yeah. So in that sense, uh, it is different. This is actually writing it in terms of spinors, which makes it easier to write actually. Okay. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Go. <clears throat> Fine. So, okay, uh, any other question? No, no. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah. So, as I said, this procedure works for certain choices of shifts uh, when there is no pole at infinity. When there is a pole at infinity, as I said, you need to just be more careful, ensure that you have taken that into account. Okay. So, let's now try to apply this to the most suitable theory for which this formalism works quite nicely, namely any plus four super angles. Okay. Now in this particular case, what happens is that maximal supersymmetry already strongly constrains the structure of the amplitudes. Nevertheless, there are large number of diagrams to compute and therefore it's still a messy computation to do. Okay. Uh, for example, if you write down n plus four super field, uh, I have called it omega, uh, this super field is, uh, contains both the helicities of the uh, gauge field, plus four fermions, plus six scalars. Phi AB are six scalars, uh, and it is anti-symmetric in AB, AB takes four values. Okay, and therefore, uh, this multiplet contains entire uh, field content of N equals four, four theory. And if you want to compute amplitudes, all you need to do is to kind of use this multiplet to compute the amplitude, okay? Now, if you want to do a, a pure gluon amplitude in QCD, okay, at tree level, that is exactly the same as gluon amplitude in N plus four super angles theory. Simply because if you take tree level gluon amplitude, in the internal propagator, you don't get scalars or uh, fermions simply because of the nature of the N plus four super angles theory in say Lagrangian, okay? And therefore, uh, pure gluon amplitudes in QCD and pure gluon amplitudes in N equals four super angles theory are essentially identical. So the complexity of the problem of computing only gluon amplitude is exactly equal. Okay. Now, of course, in N equals four theory, you besides having just gluon amplitudes, you could also have gluons and gluons and scalars and so on. And so it makes the amplitude looks more look more complicated, but at the same time, N equals 4 supersymmetry helps you to simplify the structure of the uh, amplitude. Okay, so in terms of the spinor helicity uh, formalism, the supercharges can be written in this particular form, uh, where uh, QA is written in terms of square bracket and del del eta, where eta is the uh, Grassmann variable that we have used for writing on the superfield, and QA tilde is written in terms of the Oh, sorry, Q is written in terms of square bracket and Q is written in terms of angle bracket. Uh, and uh, while Q is a derivative with respect to the Grassmann variable, Q tilde is just multiplication with respect to Grassmann variable. And A equals one, two, three, four tells you that you are doing N equals four super M S theory. Okay. The K is of course the one which keeps track of the particles. K takes the particle number actually. Okay, so super amplitude can be computed using super BCFW shift. And in that case, the square bracket is shifted by one plus Z times uh, two and angle bracket is one minus, sorry, two minus Z times one. Okay, but along with that, you need to also shift the Grassmann variable. Uh, eta hat one is written as eta hat one plus two times, uh, sorry, eta one plus two times, uh, Z, Z times eta two, okay. So, <clears throat> so of course, uh, unlike what I explained some time ago, that usual BCFW uh, formulation would have a pole at a particular point, and you will need to pick up a residue at that particular pole to compute uh, a partial amplitude, and then you sum over all possible such uh, residues to kind of compute the full amplitude. Uh, 
In this case, you will have to do additional work of integrating over the Grassmann variables. But we know integrating over Grassmann variables is not that difficult. So, like it's kind of simpler uh, in computing n equals four amplitudes uh, involving multiple fields like gluinos, scalars, gluons, everything. Okay. Now, of course, this formalism is really best suited for computing these amplitudes in in a theory with unbroken SUSY and unbroken gate symmetry. Okay, and this is because we have constructed all these spinor helicity variables, uh, angle bracket, square bracket, for p squared equal to zero. Okay, p squared equals zero means the particle should be massless. Okay, so that would mean that in n plus four super angle theory, the gate symmetry should be intact. And then the supersymmetry ensures that everybody is uh, massless. But supersymmetry should also be intact. Otherwise, it cannot, cannot relate everybody to each other. Okay, so this is a very restricted uh, uh, formalism in some sense. Uh, to put it little differently, if you look at n equals four theory in the in its Coulomb branch, then this formalism is applicable only at the origin of the Coulomb branch, at which the vacuum expectation value is zero, and of course supersymmetry is is preserved. Okay. Now clearly, there is much more to n equals four super angular theory than just uh, origin of the Coulomb branch. So one would like to kind of generalize this to uh, uh, formalism where you can uh, uh, study uh, massive fields. Okay. Now, if you want to do that, then you would. Um, I mean, this is necessitated by simple excursion in the. Uh, Coulomb branch of the n equals four theory, which will automatically make some fields uh, heavy, and you need to kind of write down a new formalism, a generalization of this formalism. Now, to deal with this uh, 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 massive uh, spinor helicity formalism was uh, proposed by Akhani Hamid, uh, Huang, and Huang, uh, and uh, and uh, it was there has been a lot of work on this in the, uh, since then. Uh, one important change uh, in the formalism is that. Uh, the original formalism had only the scaling prop symmetry, which one could call, say, uh, SO2 as a little group symmetry. The massive fields have larger uh, little group symmetry, uh, which is SO2. And therefore, if you want to write down a spinor helicity formalism, then it better be covariant with respect to this little group symmetry. Now, if you want the formalism to be covariant with respect to the little group symmetry, the first thing that you need to do is to uh, double the number of uh, spinors. Okay. Uh, and that is because if you want to write down p alpha alpha dot, it would be written in terms of angle bracket and square bracket, and uh, written in this particular fashion, where i would take two values. You can you can call it one or two, one and two, or plus or minus. I would keep switching between one, two, and plus minus in in the presentation. But main point is that this i is the index which is a doublet of the SO2 uh, little group symmetry. And this is something which is very simple uh, in the following sense that like, if you have massless spinner, then you can write that in terms of wild spinner. But if you have a massive spinner, then it necessarily has to be Dirac spinner. And Dirac spinner is always twice as big as uh, uh, wild spinner. And this is basically the statement that upper component and lower component of the Dirac spinner is labeled by P i, i being one and uh, two or plus and minus, okay? Now the problem with this is that p alpha alpha dot square now is not going to be zero because this momentum should be proportional to m squared, which is the mass of the particle. And if you are looking at corresponding Dirac equation, of course, these spinors that we are looking at are quote unquote commuting spinors, not the anti-commuting spinors like the fermions. But nevertheless, they still solve Dirac-like equation. And in the Dirac-like equation, we know that the mass term connects the angle bracket to square bracket. Okay, and as a result, uh, you, if you had worked with only a single copy of angle bracket and square bracket spinor, you would have had less number of degrees of freedom to describe uh, a momentum which squares to mass squared. Okay, and that is the reason for doubling the spinor variables. Okay, so here's the equation again. Uh, now, of course, this expression has to be consistent with the massless formalism, which is often referred to as a high energy limit. In the sense that, like, if you go to high energy limit, then finite mass object would look like massless uh, object, which is equivalent to taking m going to zero limit, and you can show that in that limit, uh, as you can see clearly, I, I will switch from i equals one to to i equals plus minus. Uh, so, if you take p plus square bracket, it goes to p square bracket. 
but p minus square bracket would vanish in mass going to zero limit. And similarly for the angle bracket, p minus will go to p uh, angle bracket, whereas p plus will vanish. Okay, and uh, this is nothing. Again, this is nothing uh, new in the sense that, like, even in uh, Dirac equation, we know that if you take non quote unquote uh, non relativistic limit, then one component is small, the other component is large. Okay, and uh, in this case, of course, we are taking ultra relativistic limit, and you would think that like both components should be large, but that's not the way because if you kind of try to work in a light like formalism then it always behaves like a non-relativistic thing. So you can reduce one uh, it to one of the components and the other components can be kind of forgotten. Okay, that is how this uh, uh, consistency is to be shown. Okay, so if you have a SUSY representation for massive fields, then you need to have Grassmann variables also to be to transform under uh, SU2 uh, little group. And therefore your eta A goes to eta A i, again, i taking plus minus of one two value. And similarly, your supercharges will carry indices ig uh, everywhere. Here's uh, zis are the, um, are the central charges. And I think I made a mistake. In the first commutator, I should have a momentum on the right hand side. Uh, is, that is missing. I'm sorry for that. OK. Fine. So uh, once the, but if I go back to n equals two, n equals four theory, uh, and if you give a vacuum expectation value to any scalar field in the n plus four theory, there are six scalars, okay, all of them in adjoint representation. If any of them takes a uh, vacuum expectation value, the original gauge symmetry will break down to a lower uh, symmetry. The gauge group will be smaller depending upon how many scalars have taken uh, vacuum expectation value, okay. And large number of gauge fields, you know, scalars will become massive. Uh, not just that, the issue of 4 R symmetry of the theory also breaks to USB 4 R symmetry. Okay. And, and therefore, the, the appearance of these multiplets is different. Okay. Nevertheless, this particular uh, Higgs mechanism is often referred to as an internal Higgs mechanism, and therefore, the massive vector multiplet continues to be BPS multiplet of the N equals 4 supersymmetry super algebra. Okay. Uh, but nevertheless, even if it is a BPS multiplet, it is convenient often to write that as a long multiplet of n plus two theory. It's the same thing which Hazashi et al. had done. Uh, and uh, one can kind of compute amplitudes of these massive fields by treating them as long multiplets of n plus two theory. Okay, so here's a long multiplet of n plus two theory, which I refer to as W, which has a, we start with a scalar and then two fermions, uh, which are doublets of the, uh, are, uh, the little group. And then there are uh, uh, scalars again, uh, three scalars, and uh, then Wij is the, is the gauge field, which is massive. Ij is symmetric, so therefore there are three components. Uh, one of the components of the scalar field is kind of um, incorporated in Wij. And then there are again fermions and a scalar. Okay, so totally you have five scalars and a gauge field with three components. That is how this long multiplet in of the n equals two theory would look like. Okay, if you have to take a massless limit of this, then what you need to do is to uh, do the following uh, change of variables. You take eta minus a to eta a, eta plus a to eta tilde dagger. Okay, and then you do what is called a half Fourier transform in which you trade off eta tilde dagger a to eta prime a. And then you can rewrite eta prime one and eta prime two in terms of eta three and eta four. That is just a relabeling. And then you get eta one, eta two from the original, and then you get eta three and eta four after the half Fourier transform, which will kind of reinstate the massless n equals four super multiplet uh, in the when you take the massless limit. Okay. So this will of course rearrange the fields that Wij will again become massless and one of the scalars will come out of that and kind of sit again with the remaining five scalars to become six scalars, okay? Fine, so let's consider computing three-point amplitude, okay? So let, I'll call it A, W, W bar, W, which means W bar has opposite helicity uh, compared to the other two. Uh, the BPS condition for uh, this tells you that the mass of the 
uh, W bar is equal to uh, the same two is equal to M1 plus N3. Okay, one can impose the central charge conservation and momentum conservation condition, and it gives you the following uh, expression that the determinant of the square bracket Ij, where Ij can take any three values, one, two, one, three, two, three. Okay, and for any such choices, the determinant would vanish. Okay, if that is the case, then you can you can write down the uh, the angle bracket plus or minus square uh, sorry square bracket plus or minus angle bracket expression in terms of two spin offs. Okay, exactly the way we had uh, written down for the momentum when p squared was zero, which can, which is equivalent to that two by two matrix uh, momentum having zero determinant. We wrote that in terms of two spin offs. Similarly, this expression can be written in terms of two spin offs, and uh, you can kind of uh, use the fact that if u and v are proportional, then their determinant would naturally vanish. Okay, so in the special three particle kinematic, you can use this fact that u and v are proportional and write down the, uh, the states uh, or the spin offs in terms of either components of u or in terms of components of v. Okay, so what I have done is to write them in purely in terms of u. Okay. While doing that, one also notices that the, these auxiliary spinors that we have written down in terms of the, the, the u's and v's, uh, they satisfy one condition, which is the square bracket relation of u with q a plus two is equal to minus the angle bracket relation of u with q dagger. Okay, this expression tells us that actually uh, because of this uh, spinor u. Uh, the supercharges are not entirely independent. Okay, so therefore, if we want to compute the amplitudes which involves delta function, for example, expression uh, written here for a three-point amplitude, you need to ensure that you are looking at only the terms which are uh, linearly independent. Uh, that means whatever is the con condition coming from an angle bracket u q with uh, uh, u q dagger with square bracket u q relation. Uh, is after that taking that relation into account, whatever is the delta function, only that delta function needs to be evaluated. Okay, if you do that, then you find that the three point amplitude for massive uh, particles can be written in two independent ways. And these are the two expressions uh, written in terms of a Q spinor, which is a reference spinor here. And the reason why we need to use a reference spin R is because of this relation written up here, square bracket Q, uh, uh, UQ A plus two with angle bracket uh, UQ A dagger, which tells you that there is there exists a particular projection of the supercharges along the U spin R, uh, which is not linearly independent. Okay, so what you need to do is to kind of introduce a reference spin R with respect to which uh, you can write down these amplitudes the reference spin R has only one property that its angle bracket with U spin R uh, is vanishing. Okay, if you do that, then uh, you can project the supercharges which are orthogonal to U and compute all your amplitudes with respect to these orthogonal projected uh, supercharges. Okay, you can, it can be shown that these amplitudes are independent of the choice of reference uh, spin R, except for the condition that the angle bracket of Q with U should vanish. Okay. Fine. So, uh, so this is a three-point amplitude. Now, if you want to construct a four-point amplitude, you need to use uh, massive PCFW, and if and the massive PCFW can be used for constructing the uh, higher-point amplitudes. Okay. So, the massive PCFW corresponds to doing the following transformation: write down P1 hat uh, shifted by Z times R, and P2 hat is shifted in the opposite way by Z times R. And R is uh, uh, is written in terms of square bracket one one and angle bracket two two. Okay, notice Excuse that. Me? Um, yes. What is the difference with the massless PCFW and massive one? Massless. Sir. What's the difference between massless and massive PCFW recursion? Oh, the difference is in the R vector. The R vector that you have written down has uh, the little group uh, expression written in terms of one and two, which breaks the little group covariance. Okay, the massless BCFW was maintaining the massless uh, little group uh, covariance manifestly. Okay, massive BCFW doesn't do that. Okay, 
in addition to that i have not written how the spinos uh, transform but spinos also transform in such a way that they also do not preserve the lewis group covariance okay so okay. so massive bcfw is little weaker than the massless bcfw but what i am going to argue is that that weakness is very important in spotting the similarities of the amplitudes and in fact uh, what we find is that like many amplitudes have similarity at infinity which actually restore the little group covariance at the end of the computation okay okay thank you so moment are shifted exactly in the same way the difference is that what is the shifting moment momentum that you use the moment yeah, yeah, yeah. that is where the difference is. okay so the four point amplitude would take a form something like this a4 with w1 w2 bar w3 w4 bar which is uh, written out here and the supercharges which i had not mentioned earlier can be written in this particular form okay uh, but maybe i'll just jump over because i have kind of running out of time um, so as i mentioned earlier that n equals 2 star is just a massive adjoint uh, theory uh, closest relative of n equals 4 and also close relative of n, of n equals 2 okay but in n equals 2 star theory also you have not only can you have massive hyper multiplet you can also have massive vector multiplet if you allow vector vector multiplication value of the to the scalar in the vector multiplet so therefore you can have massive gauge field as well as you can have massive uh matter fields or hyper multiplets okay so the question is how do you compute amplitudes when everybody is massive so for most of the amplitudes which are computed even in the massive formalism was the one which involved some particles massive but at least one particle massless okay uh, and uh, even arkani hame et al or hadesh et al computations involved at least one massless uh, uh, particle okay what we are attempting is to get all massive particle in the external lines and try to compute the amplitude okay it could have massless particle running inside but not uh, outside okay so the idea is to use the projection method this is one of the methods we have actually done this computation using three different ways uh, i introduced this u spinor maybe i can quickly kind of rush back this u spinor which is there in that expression on the top okay which was used for uh, writing down this determinant uh, being zero expression uh, you can use this u spin or formalism for computing uh, amplitudes you can also use the long multiplet uh, expression starting from n equals 1 theory to compute the amplitudes and you can use a projection method starting from n equals 4 theory all these amplitude methods actually give you exactly same answer particularly for massive uh, computations okay uh, there are small caveats where you have amplitude shifted uh, in case of bcfw but when you compute uh, the um, residue the answer is exactly same as what you would have gotten by projection okay projection method is something very simple what you do is you start with n equals 4 uh, theory uh, multiplet write it in terms of n equals 2 multiplet okay and then uh, you try to kind of uh, look at the n equals 2 multiplets and try to reconstruct the n equals 4 amplitude in terms of n equals 2 amplitude and pull it out uh, pull out the n equals 2 results uh, exactly the way you want them okay if you want to do this for massless theory it is kind of relatively easy uh, but if you want to do it for massive theories like n equals 2 star in the coulomb branch then you have different masses for vector and hyper and it would be an interesting thing to kind of carry out this computation okay so uh, even if they are different masses we will nevertheless carry out the projection and uh, if you do that then you have like two types of um, uh, three point functions one is uh, one type of three point function is where you have one massive vector uh, and two uh, massive hypers and the other is three uh, massive vectors okay uh, you can you can think of three massive hypers but n equals 2 star theory doesn't have a super potential only a quadratic term which is a mass term but no higher uh, order interaction and therefore no cubic interaction of hypers okay so this is all you have at three point level okay and once you compute this then you can employ the bcfw to compute four point amplitude okay so here is a computation that you can do in uh, two three different ways of computing one gauge field and two hypers okay uh, i have put tilde as on five but like is like you know some legacy uh, factor uh, that tilde is not very important really okay but this can be written in terms of uh, uh, the particles particle momenta as well as masses as you can see uh, the m3 mass can be written on explicitly you can kind of write try to write it in symmetric 
form with all masses m1 m2 m3 appearing in the expression but it will just make the expression look cumbersome but uh, and with a factor of one third or something but otherwise it, this is one way of writing the expression if you look at three vector amplitude that is much more cumbersome and as you can see uh, there are a lot of uh, square bracket angle bracket sitting around and also uh, uh, reference spin or q uh, sitting around but you can see that if you do a scaling of reference spin or the reference spin or scaling goes away in this amplitude and therefore you can show that these amplitudes effectively are independent of the reference spin or okay a more careful calculation can be done to show that not just the scaling but uh, entire information about the reference spin can be uh, is removed it's independent of the amplitude is independent of q Okay, so uh, I want to kind of come to BCFW now. Uh, this computation can be carried out, as I said, into two, three different ways. One of them is projection, other one is use U spin or, and the uh, third one is to go to N equals one uh, long multiplet and do the computation of in terms of the <clears throat> massive long multiplet of N equals one. Okay, now recall that the massive N equals four super field had a form which is written out here. This expression I had written earlier also. Okay, but what we will do is that you small a takes value one and two. What we will do is that we will expand this expression in terms of eta two, eta two i. Okay, and if you do that, then you can write that expression as omega is equal to phi plus eta two uh, i w i plus eta two i eta two j times epsilon i j times phi bar. Okay, uh, so this is why I was saying that I shouldn't have written phi tilde there because there is no tilde really. Uh, they are just phi and phi bar. Okay, uh, so there is some uh, error in my typing. Uh, okay, uh, so and these uh, phi, phi, phi bar and wi are n equals two superfields. Okay, and they are written uh, uh, out here explicitly, where wi, as you can see, is a massive uh, vector multiplet with wi and uh, ij symmetrized, um, having three components of the cage field. Okay, fine. So, um, so what, what one could one can do is that uh, one can try to kind of set up the BCFW, the massive BCFW that we had written down earlier, uh, entirely in the same form out here. Okay, the difference is that n equals four BCFW involved in eta two i in because eta two i uh, Grassmann variable is part of the n equals four supersymmetry, but not part of the n equals two star supersymmetry, and therefore. If you want to write down a BCFW shift by simple projection from n equals four, that is not going to work. Okay, you need to write down appropriate BCFW shift for n equals two star and compute the amplitudes using that appropriate BCFW shift. Okay, and if you do that correctly, then the BCFW recursion relation gives you exactly the same amplitude that you would have obtained by doing the projection method. Now, remember that the projection method is not very simple simply because you will have to kind of expand it in terms of uh, two etas and uh, because there are four uh, Grassmann variables in n equals four, two in the n equals two star. So you have to do expansion in two etas and then pick out the terms and write them down in terms of n equals two star and then keep track of the etas that are not part of n equals two star making the computation much more cum cumbersome Whereas BCFW is sitting entirely in n equals two stars. So if you have three point functions in, uh, at your disposal, the BCFW will automatically do the job for you. Okay. So what we have done is we have computed three types of four point function uh, uh, amplitudes, uh, uh, which exhausts all possible amplitudes that you can write down. Uh, these four particle amplitudes are four vector amplitudes, four hyper amplitudes, and two vectors and two hyper amplitudes. Of which I will write only the first two because the third one is just too cumbersome and it will just fill up the uh, screen and probably not give much information about what they are. Okay, so these are four vectors amplitude, uh, which again, as you can see, is uh, complicated. We had seen it to be complicated in four theory also. Uh, here, of course, the number of delta function is less. There are delta two q dagger times delta two q, uh, whereas it was delta four there because of n equals four supersymmetry. But for hypers amplitude is very easy. As you can see, it is written purely in terms of uh, Mandelstam variables and delta functions. Okay. However, I should mention that many of these uh, amplitudes 
when one computes using the BCFW formalism, do have uh, a singularity at uh, infinity. And what the interesting aspect of that singularity at infinity is that this computation, as I mentioned right in the beginning, is not uh, a pseudo little group covariant. Okay, but the contribution from the singularity at infinity precisely cancels the non covariant piece of this amplitude. And at the end of the day, the result that uh, one gets is little group covariant. Okay, so therefore, there is a meaning to having a singularity at infinity, uh, in particularly when you are doing non covariant computation, because that singularity at infinity is, in fact, keeping track of the covariance of the entire computation. And uh, therefore, we believe that the non covariance of this formalism is, in some sense, a blessing in disguise uh, because it is a marker to keep track of the computation, which at the end of the day would uh, restore the little group covariance. Okay. Excuse me? So, Excuse me? Yes. Uh, how much time do you need? No, I'm done. Okay. I was going, just going to the next uh, last slide, essentially. So what we have done is we have used the projection method, at least in this talk, to compute massive amplitudes in n equals two star theory. It can be done by using the u spinner formalism also, although I did not show that computation here. Uh, the uh, method that one, uh, one has used, particularly the BCFW uh, formulation, does not preserve the little group symmetry. But the final result is little group covariant, and that is quite satisfying. And uh, of course, one needs to understand as to why something like this happens. Maybe one needs to introduce some auxiliary, you know, or what one calls in supergravity language, compensator fields, which would kind of do the job of ensuring little group covariance throughout the computation. But um, uh, I'm not uh, sure whether that will work correctly, but that is one of the possible uh, ways of kind of ensuring the covariance. Uh, the, as I said, the results can be obtained by using the u spin or formalism also, although I have not presented it in the talk. Uh, and as I said, uh, I believe that the better understanding of this formalism may be a way of understanding supergravity super amplitudes using what is called a double copy formalism. Thank you. Okay, we would like to thank the speaker. Are there any urgent questions? Because the time is over. Yeah, I'm sorry. So a kind of super gravity theory is from double copy from n equal to star theory. Do you have, okay. have any idea over there? Uh, no. So the thing is that like, you know, uh, if you want to compute gravity amplitudes, then you do not want to use massive double copy because right. graviton is massless. So therefore you right. want to continue using massless double copy. But, the, but in super gravity, you have other massive fields. Okay. Mm. And yeah. other massive can be obtained by you know uh, combining uh, combining one massive uh, copy and one massless copy okay and yeah. if you do that then you can construct uh, scalar gauge field and fermion amplitudes by doing the mix of this okay and yes, uh, uh, it it is possible to do a computation of this type uh, but it hasn't been shown in general that it kind of would necessarily work for for all kinds of supergravity theories. But so you're saying that uh, you have to combine one massless and the massive yeah, theory so, together. Yeah, so it's like some kind of a heterotic uh, double copy. Okay, I see. Kind of bad language, but I mean, right. that is a... <laughs> Okay, if there is no more question, let's thank the speaker again. And we would like to thank all the speakers for this workshop. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for all speakers and participants.